Let us pray. Holy God, open our hearts, minds, and souls to you, that we may hear the words of your prophet Mary and rejoice in the hopeful proclamation that she offers the world. Amen. Please be seated. So before I launch into the sermon, I just want to tell you why I'm barefoot right now. Some of y'all caught that. So in seminary, when we were in our homiletics class, a bunch of us in my class, we preach more comfortably when we're barefoot. So we were preaching without our shoes on. And so our professor said, well, y'all are just a bunch of barefoot prophets. And so we, it just kind of stuck. And so a lot of us tend to preach without our shoes on, specifically when we are talking about prophets and prophecy. So thus, no shoes. And also my hip is just starting to hurt from the heels. So this is helpful. 324 million. That's the number of the U.S. population. Of that 324 million, 500,000 are homeless on a given night. This means that there's, they're not in a shelter. They have no bed to sleep. And these are people who are literally out in the streets on a given night. One in 30, or 1.2 to 2.8 million. This is the number of youth in America who experience homelessness in a year. And of that 1.2 to 2.8 million, 20 to 40% of that number, those youth identify as LGBTQ. Put that into perspective, 5 to 10% of the overall youth in the United States identify as LGBTQ. Meaning that the homeless population in our youth overrepresents our LGBT individuals. Six million, or 4.8% of the population. That's the number of Americans who are unemployed this year. 14.1%. That's the percentage of the total U.S. population that is underemployed. Meaning these are people who only work part-time jobs or have multiple jobs, and they're not able to bring in enough income to meet their basic necessities. 25,000. $100. This is the income for a family of four that is set as the federal poverty level. So a family of four considered impoverished, this is the amount that they bring in. And yet, 40 million Americans, or 14% of our population, lives either at or below that poverty level. And of that 40 million, 18.5 million are what we consider living in deep poverty, meaning they live on less than half of the federal income, um, federal poverty income. So 18.5 million for families of four are living on less than 25,000. Of that 40 million who are in, um, considered impoverished, 26% are single moms. 25% are adults with a disability. 25% never graduated high school. 21% are African American. 19% are people who were not born in the United States. 18% are Hispanic or Latino. 18% are children. And only 5% are those who have a college. 49 million. That's the number of people in our country who struggle to put food on their table every day. 2.3 million. This is the number of people who are incarcerated currently in the United States. And if we look at that in terms of basic, uh, looking, look at it in terms of percentage of the population, we look at it globally, the United States has the highest percentage of our population incarcerated in any other country in the world. Of that 2.3 million, 1.6 million are incarcerated for nonviolent crime. Many of those are incarcerated unjustly by mandatory minimum uh, drug law. And when we look at our prison population, white and Caucasians, which is most of us, 
for the U.S. population, we make up about 65%, but we only represent about 39% of the population in our prisons. Hispanics and Latinos represent about 16% of our population in this country, represent 19% in our prisons. And African Americans who only make up 12% of our country's overall population represents a whopping 40% in our prison. So these are some hard numbers. You may be wondering, Grant, why are you making us uncomfortable right before Christmas? At least I hope you're uncomfortable. I think we need to be when we see these numbers. I was uncomfortable. And the struggle for me, and I think for a lot of us when we see these numbers, is it's a, a reality check. It's a mirror being lifted up to our faces where we see the stark reality of our world. We see how broken it is, and we see all these people that are represented in these numbers. And knowing that the system that we live in creates this. And I think part of that uncomfortableness, that uneasiness that we feel when we see these numbers is for the vast majority of us, I won't say all because I don't know everyone's situation, but for the vast majority of us here at St. Matthew's, we're not in these numbers. For the vast majority of us, we can go home knowing, rest assured, that we have a roof over our heads and a bed to sleep in. We have food. We have more than enough food to feed ourselves. We have more than enough economic, um, financial stability that if anything were to arise, problem, we could take care of it. So these numbers make us uncomfortable. And I want us to take this uncomfortableness into the gospel this morning. Um, because I believe that this gospel passage is meant to make us uncomfortable. This is a photograph of a statue at the seminary um, that I just graduated from. It's called Mary as Prophet. And I want us to hold on to that image, Mary as Prophet. Because so often in the church, we think of Mary as this very quiet, demure woman who just said, yes, God, I'm here. And that's all she does. She's all about creating God. But when we do that, we lose her story. We lose the reality of her world. When we come into the gospel passage today, this is, you know, she's not some 20-something-year-old woman who's pregnant. This is probably a young girl, no older than 14, who is unwed and pregnant in a society and a culture and a time that said to be unwed and to be pregnant means whatever little social standing she had as a woman was gone. She was probably terrified and afraid of what was come. And so that reality is something that we need to know. It's something we need to hold on to because the reality that she is experiencing that comes out of, and the prophecy that comes out of that is very similar to the lived reality of those represented in those numbers we just walked through. But in our gospel passage for today, she offers us a prophecy called the Magnificat. Now the Magnificat, it's this beautiful piece of poetry that almost all of us know, even if you're not Christian, a lot of people know this piece. You can go onto Google and just type it in, and there's thousands of musical compositions that come up. It's a large part of our Christian heritage. From the very beginning, it is the oldest Advent hymn that we have, the oldest Christmas hymn. It's one of the eight oldest hymns that we have. From the very beginning, this has been a part of it. But so often when we listen to the music, just as the church and culture and society has tried to soften Mary and who she was and her lived reality, they want to soften the prophecy that she offers here. Because when she gathers with Elizabeth and Elizabeth speaks this beautiful proclamation to her, she proclaims back. And in the loneliness and in, in the fear and the anxiety of her own world, she proclaims a promise that she sees being fulfilled by God in the coming Messiah. And those words ought to make us uncomfortable because what does she say? That the Lord will lift up the lowly but tear down the prideful in their hearts. Take the mighty from their thrones and cast them down. That the Lord would feed abundantly those who are left hungry 
And those who have plenty, it will be taken away from and sent away. Now, I don't know about you, but I can make a guess. For the vast majority of us, including myself, that is uncomfortable. Because the reality is, we are not, and many of us are not in Mary's position. We're not in the position of those who are represented in those numbers. The reality is, for many of us in this space, we are the rulers on those thrones. We are the ones who have plenty. And so, that raises the question for me, what does this prophecy, what does this prophet Mary mean to us? What does the Magnificat mean for us? Because for those like Mary and those represented in those numbers, this is a promise of hope, of salvation, of God literally coming into the world and turning it upside down. What God is promising here and what Mary is proclaiming is being done by God is that this is a social, political, economic revolution. It's revolt. It's the world literally being transformed and made new. So that those who are not seen and heard, whose dignity has not been respected, are raised up and seen and named by God. So again, the question comes to what does this mean for us? It might not be in Mary's And I think it's an important question to wrinkle, or wrestle with. And it's one that I think we already know the answer. Because you see, this passage isn't to shame those who have that wealth. It's not to judge. In my mind, this is an invitation. It's an invitation to recognize that the systems, that the powers and principalities of this world that demonize and put those numbers down, that put people like Mary down, also enslave us. And we know this. That's why we gather here week in and week out. That's why we gather to do ministry together. That's why we come to this table, because we recognize that the salvation that God is promising to them is just as readily available to us. Because we are enslaved too. We're enslaved by the greed of this world. The messages that say you have to keep working 60, 70, 80 hour weeks and you got to bring home the green. We are um, enslaved by the materialism and consumerism of our world. We are enslaved by this desire to want more and more. We're enslaved by it because we aren't in relationship with all people. And so it's an invitation. God is inviting us into that salvation, saying that, yeah, it's not going to be easy, it's not going to be comfortable, but in my kingdom, in my reign, all people will be provided. All people will be seen. All dignity will be respected. It's going to hurt a little bit. That's the power of this Magnificat. The power of Mary's prophetic proclamation. It's so powerful that throughout the history, this section of scripture has actually been banned by government from being proclaimed in public. In the 20th century alone, it was banned in a country in Latin America. It was banned in Nazi Germany. It was banned in India when the British were colonizing it. And it was banned because the powers and people who want to keep this system in place because they benefit from it so much, they want it unheard. They want it snuffed out because they recognize that the power of this proclamation isn't tearing people down and put other people in that same space. What God is doing here is it's bringing people in relationship with one another, putting the poor and the rich side by side so they can see each other and hear their story. Because something powerful happens when the rich are the neighbors of the poor. Because if your neighbor is struggling to put food on their table and you have more than enough, who can sit there and continue to eat and just leave those leftovers there? And you know you can invite your neighbor into it. That's the power of God's radical rebellion. It puts us in relationship with God so that we see one another and we understand that the way this world wants us to operate, the way this world wants to separate us, is evil. 
and we don't want a part of it. So again, I ask the question, what does the Magnificat mean for us? For here at St. Matthew, for me, for you and your family. <coughs> for me, it means using the fruits of this system that I benefit from as a white man, that I benefit from as someone who is considered middle class, to use those resources, those economic resources, my voice, my power, and to give it away in a way that those who don't have a voice can be heard, that those who are hungry are fed, that those who aren't home, like housed are given a home. We do that here already at St. Matthew's. When we gather at our community lunches, we are not just feeding people who are hungry. We are building relationship with those that the world would not want to see us with. When we pack for backpack buddies, when we give abundantly to those who don't have, we are trying to, we are, we are working alongside God to rectify this world, to make it more loving, more just. That's what I think the Magnificat means for many of us. I won't say it does, that's up to you to decide. But for me, that's what it means. And so I leave you with that question. What does the Magnificat me, you, for us. What does it mean as we gather tomorrow night, as we celebrate and remember the coming incarnation of God in the Messiah and the Christ child? What does it mean for us to gather and celebrate that? As nice as all the stuff is, as nice as the tree decorating is and the cookies and the gifts, carols, as nice and wonderful as all that is, and we do that because we celebrate, that's not the point. We don't gather because we want gifts. We gather because deep inside we know this promise that is proclaimed by Mary today. Um, recognizing that our salvation for all of us is in the Messiah. We come recognizing that we are being invited into God's work. And that in some small way, hopefully in very big ways, we want to join that rebellion. We want to join that revolution and make this world. What does the Magnificat mean to you? And how will you respond to God's invitation into that revolt? Amen.